Um, any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or just unmute yourself and ask out loud. That's perfectly fine. We've got a pretty small group today. Um, I appreciate you joining me. We are here to get the most out of Office 365. So we're going to look um, a little bit at the whole suite and then uh, spend a little bit of extra time on calendar because that's a great tool for all of us to be using. And then a little bit of extra time on forms because I feel like that's a great tool we can all be using as well. Um, just like anything, uh, this is a very widely adopted thing across um, educational platforms. So anything you're having trouble on, um, as far as using forms online or Word online or anything Office 365, all of those things are very, very Google friendly. So type it into the search bar, see what you can find. You can always reach out to your very own instructional designer and I will be happy to work with you one-on-one -on -one so that we can get you moving forward in a successful way. Um, please do not spend too much time on anything, uh, getting frustrated with it or not being able to figure it out or looking over resources and all of those things. Reach out with the question, okay? I would love to help alleviate some of that tension that comes with not knowing the right answer or not knowing the right way. Um, that's what I'm here to do. So please reach out so I can help you with those things. All right. I'm going to get started and share my screen here. You should be seeing my Widener, which is a great place to start. Um, just like anything we talk about, I encourage you to use your bookmarks toolbar up here. So you'll notice as I kind of navigate in and out of some items, I might not come back to my Widener and search. I'll just click on the quick link that I have in the bookmarks toolbar up here. So that's really up to you. It's your preference, how you like to navigate, but that's where we're at, okay? Um, just like we talk about with a lot of our tools here that we utilize at Widener, and really a lot of the tools that we utilize in this day and age, you have both an online version and an application version of Office 365 in your possession. So what do I mean by that? I mean that when you click on your start menu of your computer, you are able to get to Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Outlook. Those are applications that are on your computer, okay? You do not need internet access to access them. You have a hard copy of them on your computer. You also, in the Office 365 suite and with your Widener subscription, have a copy of the online version of all of these components, meaning you can use Word online, PowerPoint online, okay? So keyword there is online. You need an internet connection, okay? We have to have a stable connection to use those tools because a lot of them are saving in real time. So if you're in a very clunky place and you're typing and it's having trouble saving, chances are that internet connection isn't very good. So that's something you certainly want to kind of keep in mind if you're planning on doing some um, not normal work, right? The majority of us, when we're using these tools, we're sitting at our work computer, we're sitting at our desk, so it's perfectly fine. But if you're traveling, you're at a conference, you're at a hotel, you're going to be some where else, some remote location, you just want to make sure you have that steady connection to be able to use um, the online version of these tools. Now, the great thing about using the online version is the online version talks to the application version in your computer. So if you do sign in to Word through the application, all of those things talk back and forth. So as you work on it in Word on your computer, it's also saving online. You can then access the document online and work on it there. And we'll look at a little bit. But know that those things are always what I like to say in cahoots right? They're always talking to each other. They always are looking for changes. They're always trying to update to the latest document. And the great thing about always trying to update to the latest document, and a lot of them have good retrieval tools as well, because we might be like, oh man, I did something, but I can't find it. Or, you know, I really like the version that I did last week, not necessarily this one that I made changes on. A lot of these things in the online version, we can kind of just make our way backwards in those saves. So that's a great uh, thing as well. So I started by talking about having both the online version and the application version on your computer. Now, some of us might be in the case that we buy a new computer and with that new computer, they say, hey, congratulations, you get 60 free days of the Office 365 suite. And then after that, they try to get you to pay for it, right? 
do not pay for it, okay? With your Widener email address and credentials, you get those things for free. So if they're on your computer already, the only thing we need to do is sign into your Widener account in order to keep them active, all right? If they're not on your computer, right? We know that sometimes we go to buy a device or we inherit a device from someone and those tools aren't there, right? We need to download them. We need to download Word. We need to download Excel. We need to download the Office 365 suite. That is easy as well. So all I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to kind of my top landing here, which is just our email online, right? Our email, which aka Outlook, is part of the Office 365 suite. Here is Outlook online. And then here is the Outlook application on your computer. Now, it's hard to make a blanket statement because everyone in Widener kind of uses it in a different way. Some people just like the online version. They don't like the Outlook version. Some people strictly like the Outlook version. Don't spend a second on the online version. Some people use both, right? So it's really your preference. Um, I find that certainly when I'm sitting at my computer using the Outlook application works best for my need, right? Because I'm constantly looking at my calendar. I'm constantly looking at my email. I'm able to do a lot more searching and I have a lot more tools that go along in the toolbar of the Outlook version than I do just in a regular email, right? So you feel like you have a little bit more control. There's nothing wrong with the online version. It's just there's less tools, right? Because it's online. We can't have all those tools because your bandwidth won't support it, right? So they have to say, what's the most important? What are we going to need the most? And that's what you're going to find in the online version. Now, that's not just for Outlook. That's for everything, right? So if you're working on a scholarly paper, or you're working on some kind of large data set in Excel, something like that, I would encourage you to be using the application on your computer for those things, because you have the tools that you're used to using. You have the Excel calculations. You have all the tools that go along with APA format and citations and all those things that go along with those kind of events inside of the Word version application, okay? So I point you towards those for kind of the larger tasks. But back to our original thing here, we wanted to get Outlook, Excel, Word on our computer. If you click in your top right-hand corner of your mailbox where your beautiful face is, if it's not there yet, I encourage you to click on where your gray silhouette is, or if it's not there, it might be your initials, and put your picture there. The same way we do in Canvas, the same way we do in Zoom. That way, when you're emailing people or you're staying in contact with them, you're able to put a face to a name, right? And we know that in the world that we're in, we don't always get the face. We get a lot of names, but we don't always get the face. So certainly as the instructor, as the person who's trying to model the professional behavior for our scholars that are coming up beneath you, adding those things to your profile and making those things visible for our students is best practice, okay? Certainly that's your choice, but I think modeling those things for our students only behooves them to do it themselves, right? If we don't do it, it's like, well, why would I do it, right? So put those things in front of them. If I go in here to view account, I open to a new tab, and inside of this new tab, I get da, 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 dum, office apps. You also have it here on the left-hand side, okay? Click it. It takes you to the same exact place. It gives you this nice kind of update of, okay, install office apps. You can install off, up to office apps five times. So five PCs, five Macs, five tablets. You're just hitting install office from there. OK, that will put the suite on your computer. Now, when you get on to the actual application on the computer, it's going to say, OK, you've installed. But who are you? Right. This is where you can see in my top right hand corner. I have my Widener account linked to my Word online. All right. When you first stall, install and it's been a while since I've done this, so I'm going to speak as to the way it normally looks, given these things always change. But when you first install, it will ask you to authorize. And it'll say, do you work for an organization or a school that you have an office subscription in? And you say, huh, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. I work for Widener. And you type Widener in, you hit enter, and then you get our beautiful old main sign-in screen, right? We have old main on the left, we have our username, our password, that same sign-in screen we have for everywhere else. 
you'll get here on Word when you're then linking those accounts, okay? Pretty straightforward. Again, I assure you, you are not the first person to link your school account to your Word application. So there's obviously other people that have done this. There's videos of people walking through how to do it. There's tutorials and snippets online with screenshots that can show you how to do that. So all of those resources are available to you as you're kind of making your way here through the shallow waters of getting yourself started. Now, for the majority of us, this stuff's already done, right? We already have the applications on our computer. We already have them connected. That's all good. Perfect. Let's move on to the good stuff. What do we really get with Office 365 Suite? Now, again, here I am just on my regular kind of email. You'll notice here in my top bar, I just label it my at Widener, right? Because I'm a bubble at Widener. I don't need that whole thing there. I don't need Outlook. For me, that just tells me that's that email address and that's how I access it. Now, a lot of things going on here on your dashboard of your email. And they've really come a long way to kind of make everything into one click. For example, up to last summer, these Word, Excel, PowerPoint, OneNote links were not in this bar, okay? The only way to get to these applications were clicking on your beautiful waffle in the top left-hand corner, okay? Those nine dots get you to all of your applications. Now, we kind of have these quick jump off points that if I need a Word document, I can click right there in my email and start a Word document. Another great feature of this is that when you do click on it, it opens in a new tab. So here's my email where I just was. I didn't lose it, right? I can still go back and forth. I don't have to be in the Word document and be like, well, wait, I didn't, I forgot to look at what I needed to type from that email and now I have to hit the back arrow. No, everything opens in a new tab. So it's a beautiful thing. Your email is still up top. I can get over here and still get to all of my apps. And here I am in Word Online. Now we talked a little bit about the, um, the features, right? The difference that you get between the online version and the application version on your computer. And we said, yes, if you're dealing with large data sets, or you're writing an article or any of those things, best yet, to stay on the application on your computer because you get a more robust toolbar, okay? You get all of those tools. Not to say that you can't open PowerPoint online here and make a couple changes to a presentation in real time, right? You realize a link's old or you realize you typed a word wrong or something, perfect. Open it up, change it, you can do it right there. The end all be all greatest thing that comes from the PowerPoint on online is the designer, okay? Inside of your regular PowerPoint application, you do not get the designer, okay? What you do get is kind of a, hey, do you want this kind of slide type? How do you want it to look? So on and so forth. So let me open this PowerPoint here and show you real quick. Again, here's my toolbar, yada, yada, yada. Let me go to one of my slides here. And when I click on the slide, you can see that I get my designer in the top right-hand corner. So what's happening here is that the system is using AI, artificial intelligence, and looking at your page and saying, you know what? What could we do better on this page? And it generates a couple different ideas of different ways that information can be displayed. Now, we know that when we originally type things, we probably just start with bullet points and we might throw an image on it and then we have a link or something like that. But this designer really expands the way that some of this stuff can be displayed. So here's a good example, right? You see my light bulbs on the right-hand side, my text on the right and making its way through. Look at the designer. This gives you what well, looks like up to maybe 10 ways, eight or 10 ways of the different ways that this page can be designed, okay? Using that same image, but maybe moving the text over a little bit, spreading it out a little bit, making the image smaller, taking some of those things that it sees as big pieces and making them into a different color and putting them in a different box, okay? So this is a great tool that you have on the online version of PowerPoint that is definitely more robust than the application itself on your computer. Okay, so that is a plus there. 
But what I really want to show you here is all of the apps that really come with your Office 365 subscription. You'll see that some of these things are linked here by Weiner themselves. You have a quick link to your LinkedIn Learning. You have a quick link to my Weiner, and you have a quick link to your Zoom. And then you have all of these things that are here inside of your actual Office 365 suite. Now, I would say for the most part, you know, 90% of our time is probably spent just right here in email, right? We're just answering email. And then from email, you might click over to the calendar, right? Because you're making an appointment or you look, you look at what's coming up or so on and so forth. So let's spend a little bit of time here in the calendar, all right? Because this is something that I feel like we do see a lot of people utilize across campus, right? When you get meetings from different groups or you get our faculty meeting or you get any of my professional development trainings, the same way you got this one today, it comes in a calendar invite. So that when you say, yes, I accept this, I would like to come. Or when you say, hmm, I don't know if I want to come, I'm just tentative as the word they like to use. Those things are directly imported onto your calendar. You don't have to look at the email and it says, there'll be a training on 921 at one o'clock. See you there. And it's like, okay, well now I have to go to my calendar and I have to go to 921 and I have to put in one o'clock and I have to add the Zoom address and I have to put in all this information myself just so that I'm able to attend the event in a timely manner, in a professional manner, right? So we want to kind of try to avoid some of those things, right? And that doesn't necessarily have to be for a whole group. This could just be a meeting with a colleague. This is just a meeting with maybe a cohort or a doctoral student or someone you're working with in the honors program or someone from across campus, or maybe it is a whole group meeting. But either way, when we do a new event inside the online version, Okay, I come to the default screen here where I can invite my attendees. Okay, by you putting that person's name in, and look at who's at the top of the list here. By you putting that person's name in, I wonder who I spend a lot of time with. We are able to sit and work together and have that calendar invite actually put right on our calendar so that you get that beautiful notification of, hey, something's coming up in 15 minutes. Or in the morning, when you look, like for me, I probably not the best habit, but I pick up the phone right when I get out of bed and I need a reminder of, okay, what's happening today? And I go to my calendar right away just to see a linear version of things that not only I've scheduled for myself, because sometimes I have to block out time just so I can get work done, or things that I've scheduled with other people. But those calendar invites are put right in. Now, again, the online version, we've talked about some of the things that are a little bit better online and some of the things that aren't a little bit better online, right? We talked about the toolbar, we get better in the apps. We talked about the designer, we get a better opportunity inside of the PowerPoint. The calendar does a great job of finding times where you and the people you're trying to work with can be together so that you can skip those emails of, hey, when are you available? And then it's, they answer it the next day. And now a whole day has passed. And the days that you said you were available, you're no longer available because you spoke with 10 other people and you scheduled three other things, right? So here you get the opportunity that as I put in Kim, I can see that these are the places that the system has come up with where both of us are available according to our calendars. Now, this is where an important facet comes in because it's looking at your calendar. So if Kim doesn't put anything on her calendar, which I know is not true, but if, if Kim doesn't put anything on her calendar, the system sees her available all the time. And we know that's not the truth. So that's why we talk about at the bare minimum that at least you put in your class schedule, right? We know that you're not gonna be able to come to a meeting when you're teaching a class. Right. Or if you need work time and you're blocking off two, three hours in the afternoon for yourself to work on your own things, to work on your own scholarship, to have another meeting with a colleague, to just be in your office, or maybe you just need a drink, block off the time for yourself so that these 
times don't come up as available for everyone when someone's trying to meet with you. Now I can keep on adding to this. You'll see that it repopulates. Now it knows that not only do I need Kim, I also need Norma Jean. And these are the three times where all of us are going to be available for that meeting. I can take it a step further and click on my preferences and change this up a little bit. Maybe I want a whole hour availability. And maybe I don't want the earliest. I want to look for something next week. So we can't really go like AM or PM, but we certainly can go a little bit further out, right? Because we know that there's some individuals that, you know, I'm not available at all this week on a Monday. So I need you to look for the next week or even the week after. So you get that ability to do that a little bit. The other option that you have here outside of the suggested times, again, this was new as of just probably eight months ago, they started with these suggested times. The normal tool is the scheduling assistant, right? And this is both here in the online version and here in the regular version. When I go to do a new appointment, I can also bring up my scheduling assistant. But notice when I put Kim, da, 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 da. oh, you know why? I need to do invite attendees. You're not the subject, you're an attendee. So when I put Kim, I don't get those kind of little blocks. What I do get is a little bit of uh, the room finder over here, but that's not much use to us because a lot of the times we're online anyway, right? So I don't get the suggested times here I need to click on scheduling assistant and I'll see the opportunities like here. I know Kim is out of the office. You see how out of the office is purple. Kim's purple all the way through. So that's not going to work. So I need to just use my arrows to go to a different time here. Kim is available, but I am not available. So you kind of got to make your way through on the scheduling assistant, right? But the main purpose of this conversation don't save changes. Don't worry, Kim. I won't invite you to anything. You're already here. The main purpose of this conversation is so that the calendar invite is now directly imported to the other users, right? So when I send this to Kim and Norma Jean, and I say Tuesday, 921 from 4 to 430, notice when I click on it, it automatically updates down here. I don't need to go down and click and find my calendar and go through it and find four. I don't need to do any of that, okay? I can turn my Teams meeting on right away. It will create a link or you're welcome to just paste your Zoom address in there. You can see it sees some of the suggested things as you continue to work through the system. Again, this is all on AI. So it says, oh, I see you use this a lot. That's my Zoom address. Boom, it puts it right in there for me, okay? So some of these things get to learn your habits and learn your nuances. Here is my 15 minutes before. I will get a reminder saying, hey, remember you had this meeting coming up with Kim and Norma Jean on 921 from 4 to 4.30. So at 3.45, I will get a reminder from the system that that's coming up. And then of course, it will appear on my calendar itself as I look at that day. Discard this event. Okay, perfect. As I look at that day right here. Okay, so a massive tool, not only for you to stay organized, but for your colleagues to work cooperatively with you without the back and forth and the back and forth and the back and forth. We're all guilty of it, right? And I do it a lot too, mainly with the students, because I know a lot of us are good with calendars, but it's like, hey, when are you available? And then we know the students don't check it till two days later. And when I told them I was available, I'm no longer available because everything changes within 48 hours, right? That's not going to be the case anymore. So that's where we can use a little bit of this stuff to our advantage. Um, certainly with our colleagues, definitely in our cooperative instances of working with a group, again, working with doctoral students, working in your different committees, having these things on your calendar. And again, the best practice for you is to build out your own calendar because using the suggested times, using the find time, using the availability, none of that stuff is worth anything if your calendar isn't populated with truthful information. Or I shouldn't say truthful information, some of it might not be true, with 
information, right? Class times, out of the office, doctor's appointments, mainly things that don't make you available, right? You're on vacation. Put that on your calendar and block off all those days so that when your committee goes to look for dates six months out, they don't say, oh, well, it looks like everyone's available here. And then all of a sudden you get the email, you're like, oh, I'm on vacation that week. Well, put that vacation on your calendar, block that time out so that, again, not only can your colleagues see it, but when you are trying to keep up, you kind of have a little bit of, uh, yeah, thing in your back pocket. You're like, well, I built out my calendar. My events are on there. This is when I'm available. I wasn't available then. So the meeting was scheduled then. I can't attend because I'm not available. So you kind of have that, that kind of, well, I don't want to call it a told you so, but you kind of have that balance in your back pocket because you've done your part, right? You've built out your events and your calendar. So now when people are booking things and trying to get to things, they can't necessarily say, well, I said you were available. So that's when I did it. Well, I'm really not available. So make sure that those things are built out for yourself in those spaces. I'm going to pause there real quick because we're already halfway through, believe it or not. And I've talked for quite a while. I want to check my chat, make sure I didn't miss anything. I did not miss anything. Does anybody have any questions? Um, Go ahead, Benny. Uh, just a quick question. When you say application version, it means the Outlook version. Am I right? That is correct. Okay. And the, the second thing, uh, there is something called security McAfee, like the laptop or the computer security. So uh, I'm not sure about the university provided uh, laptop and the uh, desktop, but the personal laptop that I have, that occasionally shows up that you need to subscribe to McAfee security. So can, like I just need a little bit more understanding. So do I have to buy that or is it provided by the university as an employee to us? Because um, if it, use the personal laptop also to the screen to work on that. Correct. So the system that comes with all university devices is a tool that's right here in your bottom bar called Malware Bytes. Okay, that is what the university uses for its security on its own devices. You are correct that a lot of our at-home devices, personal stuff, come with McAfee standard. They give you the first year, or they give you the first three months, and then they try to hit you up for $69.99 for the next year, or they say, hey, want to subscribe for two years? You'll save 24%. Just subscribe for two years because you know you're going to do it anyway. But the, um, there is a discounted version through Widener okay. for McAfee. If you go into my Widener and you search, I think, just discounts, we should be able to get it. Personal software and hardware purchases. Okay, takes you to a page where you can then go to your journey ed is the soft or is the actual platform. And then on Journey Edge, it has different things to go through as far as getting your um, different security onto your own personal device. Oh, okay. But there is, um, to answer your second question, there is nothing provided free of charge for your personal devices from Widener. That is something that you're responsible for because it is your own device. So we have a discount, but just not free of charge. But all university provided are having the required safety net. Yes, if it is a university system laptop, you are fine. Okay. You have the most updated version and that malware bytes is finding new definitions and new security updates on a daily basis. Anytime you connect online, it is updating. So in real time, it is working for you. Um, and that's just working in the background. You're all good there. Just a little bit on the signature part. Can you show us like some changes needs to be done? Tell me again. The signature part when the email signature, like your name, something. Changes. Oh yeah, for sure. The signature part. So when you send an email, you get your signature down here at the bottom. 
of the email. Mm -hmm. If you want to now, it would be a great thing if that worked across all platforms, but everywhere you have Outlook, that needs to be updated. So if you're using Outlook on your phone, you update the signature on your phone. You're using Outlook on your tablet, you update the signature on the tablet. You use Outlook here online, you update the signature here. You use Outlook on your computer, you update the signature there. So that is one thing that does not talk across. So that signature is in a different place in all of those things. Here on the online version, if you click on the settings and then you go down to view all Outlook settings, and then inside of mail, you have your compose and reply. And then that first box allows you to build out your signature for the bottom of the message. I also have these two options. I want to automatically include it, include it on things I compose and automatically include it on anything I forward or reply to. So anything I send has my signature on it. I would suggest you do the same thing in a professional setting. There's no harm, no foul there. For the most part, for me, it gives them another link to my email and another link to my Zoom room. And for the most part, that's what people are looking for when I'm trying to get a hold of them. So I would have that included. Now, if you're here on Outlook, the desktop version, I need to go to file. And inside of file, I go to options. And inside of options, I go to mail. And inside of mail, I go to signatures. Okay, so that one's a couple more steps. Let me start from the beginning. So on the application, I'm going to file. And then inside of file, I go to options. Not on the application, on the online version. On the online version. Yep, the online version is just going to settings yeah. and then going to the top box. Not as many clicks there. Mm -hmm. Okay, but again, if you ever use the application, you have to set up the signature in there. If you reply from your phone, you have to set up the signature in there. If you reply from your Outlook app on your iPad, you have to set up the signature in there. So all of those different places kind of need their own setting. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. thank you. So all right, much. perfect, no problem. All right, good, that was one thing that was actually on my list. So I'm glad that you brought that up. I can cross that thing off. Um, so we looked a little bit at the calendar invites. I wanna just jump across back to my all apps and point out one important thing when it comes to working in the online version of these applications. I'm gonna to go to my word here and open up uh, something I've already been working on. Mary Powell sent this, you sent this. I want my own documents, my recent. Okay, so here, guidelines, this is perfect. Okay, here I'm working on the Word online version. Again, we talked about the toolbar, right? You can see that this toolbar isn't as robust as bringing up the actual Word application on your computer. So let's say, okay, I started in the online, now I'm going to open in the desktop app, meaning I'm now taking this document that I was working online and I want to open it in Word on my computer. Okay, here's Word launching. My toolbar is much more robust. This looks a lot familiar to us because I'm sure 90% of the time we're working on this word. We're not on the online version. But look what happens to your save symbol up in the top right-hand corner, okay? You'll notice that the default on your computer when you work in any other application is just a regular floppy disk, okay? That is just you saving the document on your computer. You save it on the desktop, you save it in documents, you save it in some folder, whatever that might be. But the beauty of starting in the online version and then opening in the Word version or in our computer is that when we save here, you notice you have this little refresh symbol on top of the floppy disk, okay? That is saving the document in real time back to OneDrive. So if you're working on the document with someone else, 
or you're working on it here and you then want to access it on a different computer or you want to access it in a different location, you save that back to OneDrive and you don't need to go in and as a lot of us do is, oh, I made a change, let me re-email it to myself. Or I made a change, let me put it and re-upload it back into the cloud. You don't need to do that when you start on the online version and go to the desktop version. The only thing we need to do is hit the save in the top right-hand corner. And now my most recent version is saved back to the cloud online. And then that way, when I exit here and I go to work on the exam soft guidelines on a different computer on campus, I have that same version I just worked on on this computer at my house, right? So it really increases the productivity when we have to go from place to place or thing to thing. Now, again, the majority of the time, you're perfectly fine because you're sitting at the same computer, you're at your home or you're at your work, and there might not be a massive need for that feature. But we also know that as our social engagements tend to tick up here and we get back to real life, we might be working in different places, going to more conferences, going to more co cooperative, co cooperative opportunities with our colleagues in different locations. So some of these kind of online back and forth versions and features might be a little bit more handy as we tend to open the COVID gates a little bit more. Okay, so keep that in mind. All right. Let me jump off of there, remind you again that we have all of these great tools on the left-hand side. Uh, Teams is something that is coming to a little bit more fruition on campus. It grows a little bit more each semester. It's just the really, really fancy version of Zoom and it sleeps inside of our own Office 365. So you get all of the tools that you have in Office 365, you get in Teams, right? You can share a Word document, you can work on real time, you can connect with colleagues in a click, you can do video, you can do audio, you can do all those things. Um, or we will have a Teams training coming up, right? We're gonna spend specific time on Teams itself because there is so much that you can do inside of there. So be on the lookout for that one. That one will probably, eh, we'll see, come up somewhere in October, I would think, all right, after we get our September shoes off here. But our next part of this session here that I wanna concentrate on outside of, we looked at a lot at email, setting up signatures, we talked about the different kinds of things that go on between the online versions and the offline versions of these, but a massive tool here inside of Office 365 is forms, okay? Now the forms part of the suite does not exist on your computer, all right? You do not have a forms application. You need to be online to get to this application, to get to forms, okay? I can open Excel here on my computer. I can open Word. I can open PowerPoint. I can open Outlook. I can open OneNote. There is no forms application on your computer. You have to actually either click on your waffle and get to forms, go to your left-hand menu and get to forms, or go to our handy dandy My Widener tool and Dang, not type in forms. Well, they don't have a quick link. I'll have to talk to someone about that. But you can see why, because form is a very popular word across my winer. So I could see why we maybe didn't have that one in there. But we could go to Office 365 and then inside of there, be able to launch a couple more of these tools from this menu. So there's always that option. I would say the most of the time though, I go to the waffle here in the top left, click on forms. When you do that, you see your landing page, which is all of the forms that have been created inside of your account. You also have the option to pin them, which means that they're kind of right in front of you, right? Just like we would pin anything. And then you have the things that are shared with you, right? So these are the people who sent out other things they were on a form and they said, oh, I wanna share this with Andrew so that we can collaborate with him. I'm going to show you how to do that. You'll see in your top left-hand corner, you can start a new by plus new quiz or new form, right? So what's the difference? Let me show you. Here is the quiz. 
and it starts here. I can do add new, I get choice, text, rating, date. Here is my form. I can start a new, I get choice, text, rating, date. Wait a second, that's the same. Guys, you're not missing anything. It's exactly the same. All they're doing is using the different word. So even if you click new quiz or new form, you get to the same page, except they use the word quiz or they use the word form, okay? I would certainly encourage you that if you're creating some kind of quiz for students, you start in the quiz function. If you're creating some kind of form for your colleagues, you start in the form function, but you're not necessarily getting a ridiculous amount of features on either one, you're getting the same exact thing. Now, coming back here to your form, this is pretty self-explanatory, so I'm not gonna spend a whole lot of time on this, but you can see that I can start a new, right? And let's say I just want a multiple choice question. I can start a new, I can put in a text question. I can start a new, I can put in a rating question, or I can start a new, I can put in a date question. If you kind of rewind your brain and you think about the form that we created for our testing information, we get these types of questions, right? These are just answer questions. We have users typing in their answer. And then as we make our way down, we can kind of set some parameters. Here is us putting in a date, right? So we don't have users typing out September 9. You're actually giving them the calendar feature to click on a calendar and put in the date, all right? So a lot of things that can be done inside of here. Also, right, preview lets you see it as the user that you're sending it to, both computer and mobile version. Very important to think about if you are trying to make something quick, you want people to answer it very easily, make sure that mobile version is friendly. Right. We know that there's some forms we fill out that they're not going to be friendly for our mobile version. Like, for instance, our scholarship form. There's a lot of fields on there. There's a lot of things that collapse, different menus, things like that. So that might not necessarily be the most mobile friendly form. But here, if you're sending something to students or you're creating an attendance form for them, that's the way a lot of people use our forms. We use them for attendance in the beginning of class. Make sure those things are mobile friendly. Okay, now not only do we get our, da, 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 let me get back to our forms landing page here. Not only do we get the opportunity to create our different questions, they've done a really great job of um, collaborating all of the responses that come along with a form, right? It used to be that when you did this, and this is when this first came out, that the only thing you could do is export all of the data into an Excel document. Now, when you do it, they have, they have, it's actually unbelievable. When you come to each question, not only have they created word clouds for things that have been entered multiple times, you can see what's the most popular name in our, in Wusun. There's four Marys, right? That's why Mary's so huge on, on here, right? And you can see that these are some of our course coordinators. So they filled out the forms more than once. So that's why the system's putting them there. They're saying, we see a lot of responses from these people. Okay, same thing here. What's the name of the class? We have advanced in a lot of our titles, right? So it's seeing that word advanced a lot. So it's giving you a good summary of things. So why would this be useful? Think about this in class. If you just have this as an exit ticket for students, name something that you're still struggling with in this class. And students just quickly type out, I'm still struggling with heart disease. I'm still struggling with, I don't know, whatever else it might be. The system is capturing those things in real time. So now you as the instructor, instead of, don't, don't not do this, instead of going in and looking at every individual response, you can come in and have a very quick snapshot of the words that your students have used the most. So you know that when you put that question, what are you struggling on? That if you have a whole bunch of people that use that same word, that's a topic that you need to look at and you need to fill the gaps of knowledge for, for your students, okay? Same thing here if we're using this amongst our colleagues. And we say, what day of the week is the best for you? And you send it out to 20 people. 
and 17 of those 20 people say Tuesday. Well, guess what? Tuesday is going to be really big on your response page because everyone has indicated that. So rather than going through and saying, okay, I have, let's see, one Monday, here's a Tuesday, here's a Wednesday, here's a, like, all of that takes so much time. A lot of the AI here is just looking at that stuff for you. You know what day is best for them because that's what the responses page is showing you. So a lot of good data that can come from those open-ended responses. I encourage you to use it in those fashion. Exit tickets, entrance tickets, wrap-ups, just informal assessment, right? You know those questions that your students struggle on and those concepts that your students struggle on, on your formal assessments, that stuff we have on ATI, that stuff we have on ExamSoft. We're always going to have to ask those things. But let's try to give our students, just like anything we do, we need to practice our practice, right? We need to see the questions more than once. We need to talk about the concept more than once. We need to see the question in a different way. We need it explained in a different way. So the more exposure we give our students to this concept, these concepts, concepts and content, the more likely they are to move it to long-term memory, be able to retain it and be successful in their practice, right? So instead of going on and saying, okay, you know, I'm going to create another practice quiz or, you know, I'm going to go on and create something in Canvas. You can certainly do this in Canvas quizzes, but here you could build this inside of forms and you get a much more, what I would call friendly snapshot of what the responses are. If you build this inside of Canvas, you just get what the individual user answered. And yeah, you could go through and say, okay, it looks like we're getting a lot of people who need a lot of help with heart disease. Okay, it looks like I should go over that. But here, you're just trying to gain an understanding of what your students' thoughts are. So this is very informal. You put up a QR code at the end of class. It's a very basic question. What's something you thought went very well today? They all answer. What's something you thought could be better? They all answer. And then as you're sitting down in your free time, because we all know we have so much of that, you can go to your response page and say, okay, everyone seems that we did really well on talking about atriums today. I don't know, whatever. You could tell I'm not a nurse. I, I always make that so evident inside of these things. I have such a hard time coming up with things to say sometimes, but you get the point, right? Okay, everyone did well on this. Great, they thought it did well. You know what? I felt like I explained that really well. Give yourself a pat on the back. You're an educator. You did a great job explaining it. You put great content in front of you. And the majority of your class feels like they know it and they're going to be successful with it. You did a great job. That's a great celebration for you because it's hard to see those positives. Sometimes we get very caught up in, oh my God, I got all these students who aren't doing well. I got all these kids who don't know this concept. We need a reminder that you're doing a heck of a job. And you have a hard time sometimes bringing those students up to speed on a daily basis. So here's an opportunity for you to say, you know what, what's going well in this class? What do we know? What have we done well? Ask that question and give yourself a pat on the back and then scroll down and see what else you got to work on. What's not going well? What do we need to spend a little bit more time on? And if they identify those things in more fashion, then you know, what we, let me find another resource. Let me record a different PowerPoint. Let me record a different lecture on this topic. Let me find a good YouTube video I can point them towards because they need something else. They're telling you they still don't get it. So rather than finding that out on the exam, because only 25% of the class of your 168 students answered the question right, 75% of your class doesn't know that content. You can find those things before that, and you can supplement the learning. And believe me, the students, and you know this, take your mind back to being a student. Think about being in that seat, and your professor says to you, I looked at your responses, and it seems like a lot of you are still having a hard time with blank. I have created an extra module inside of our Canvas course that has six different resources, five different resources, two different resources, whatever it is, that will help you with this concept. Things we haven't looked at yet, things that I feel like are going to be really helpful and bring your learning along. 
And now the student says, wow, they are listening to what we need. That's what I put on the form. That's what I said I needed more help on. And that's exactly what I got here. And I am willing to bet, and believe me, I'm a betting man. I am willing to bet that that student comes into your class with a more positive outlook on their learning and your teaching when they know that that has occurred behind the scenes. Rather than, hey, what are you guys doing really good at? And then nothing happens, right? We're looking for a cause and effect relationship here. What are the students telling you and what can you do to make it better? I think that kind of that informal kind of digestion of glows and grows, I like to call them, or things we need to get better at, things that we are already good at. And those student conversations can really help here because we know when we ask those questions in class, we get very minimal participation. And especially if you're in Zoom, you're not going to get a lot of people to unmute yourself, unmute themselves to say those things out loud. But what you can do is come up here to the top and say share and copy the address and take it and paste it right in your chat so that as you are teaching and as you are working, the students can go in and answer that form and give you that data that you're looking for as the instructor to improve your instruction and improve your students learning right there Andrew, in real time. Go ahead, Juanza. I had a question, I'm sorry, about sure. the forms. Um, so if I originally create a form um, to do through the computer, can I change it and make it mobile? Am I able yes. to do that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All your forms are mobile. Oh, they are. Yes. So it's, it's, if they click on it on the computer, they get, they get that version. If they click on it on their phone, they get that version. Oh, okay. So just a matter of copying the um, email link and then just um, sending it and then they can do it either way. Yeah, and same thing because oh, if I get I get my email on my phone, so when I okay. open that email on my phone, I just click your original link, and okay. it opens that form on my phone. And okay. really, that's a way that a lot of your students would be using, it, right? They wouldn't necessarily be using it on right. the computer; they would be using it on their device, right? So that's why not only do we get this copy code, but another very popular thing is the QR code, right? Because oh, now you could, we could do that. Yeah, now How you can did take you just the. Do that? It's just the link over. So instead of the link here, okay. which is its default, you just click on these five dots oh. and that's your QR code, oh, right? Great, so great. that can be put up in the front of the class. The students scan the QR code with their form and they fill it out. Or you put it at the bottom of a PowerPoint slide. The students are looking at that slide and they fill it out. I've seen yeah. it done that way, just kind of informal assessment on a given topic. It's, hey, take this, this, you know, this short questionnaire and you put the QR code down at the bottom of the slide you have them concentrating on, excuse me, and they can work from there. And then how's your experience? Because so, a lot of my classes are in alumni, which is, you know, quite a distance. It'll work the QR code. Thing. The QR code is tough in alumni. Okay. It is, it is tough. I would, I would suggest to you that if you are going to use it that way, that you have another way for them to get to it. So maybe okay, you- the link. You, yeah, you maybe drop it in a module in Canvas okay. or you send it in an announcement in the Canvas course so okay. that not only can they scan the QR code in the front of the room, they can bring up the QR code on their own device and scan mm -hmm. it that way. Yeah, because okay. it, it is tough in alumni on that screen. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Uh, the other options you have here outside of providing a link, a QR code, is you have the embed option which means you just take it and you embed it on a page. So this could just be put on a page in a module, right? So that they don't even have to go to forms. They just fill out the form inside of Canvas. Okay, so that can be done as well. And you can also just email this. You can see that when I clicked on the email, it brought up just a fake email here and I just send it to whoever I need to. So a bunch of different ways you can distribute it so that your, uh-oh. No, um, so that the people you want can get it. Another important setting is who are you sending it to, right? Up here, you have only people in your organization can respond. That means they're gonna have to sign in to create the form and or to fill out the form. That is the biggest thing we have to combat the attendance thing. Because people say, oh, well, if I make an attendance form, doesn't that mean that Susan can fill out the form for John? 
No, Susan can't fill out the form for John because Susan has to sign in to Susan's Widener account to fill out the form. And that data follows her information. So when you see Susan signed in, you then just can't have John's name in attendance, right? Because you see who signed in to fill out the form. So if you are doing the attendance thing, keep it here to only people in your organization can respond. And then that way you have to sign in to Outlook or you have to sign into Office 365 to actually complete the form. If you wanna send it out to anybody, you just hit your drop down and you just do anyone can respond. And then that way, when I send the link, anyone in Timbuktu can click on my link and do, we do not have to sign in anywhere and fill out the form for themselves. Andrew, just to clarify, you mean anyone who you send the link to, correct? Correct. Okay. Yes, you have to, you still have to distribute it. Yes, okay. absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you here is the uh, collaborate, which is you sending it to another colleague, right? If you're working on someone and you want them to be able to edit the questions or edit the text or things like that, you want to send the collaborate link, right? And that gives me the ability to edit on the page. If you just send them this link, that only lets them actually submit the form. I can't do any editing. So if you're working with a colleague, you're working on the same thing, you wanna be able to send that out and collaborate with them. You it's just a different link there. I am at 201 and that went really fast. So I'm going to pause there, see if I have any questions, open it up for any kind of dialogue you might wanna have. I also want to obviously caveat that again, these are very widely used tools. So Google is your friend when it comes to these things. And your instructional designer is always here to work on anything you want to do in Office 365. You wanna take a deeper look into forms. You wanna talk about how you might be able to use it in your class. You wanna talk about how you might be able to use it in your administration, administrative duties, whatever that might be. I am all ears and open to a conversation on that topic. Is there anything I can answer today? Go ahead, Banny. So, Andrew, a quick question before you leave. Sure. Uh, you explained us two different concepts. One is the application version, which is the Outlook, and the other is the online version. Correct. Now, all of us always use either Word document or PowerPoint document or Excel document. These are the common documents. So, based on the understanding you gave us right now, the online version is ideally better than the Outlook or the application version in terms of both Word as well as PowerPoint. What you said is in PowerPoint, we have the designer things that is obtainable in the online version, which is not in the Outlook version. It uh, is. Second thing is the Word document. The, when you save the Word document, it goes to the OneDrive uh, in the online version as compared to saving the document, which does not go to the OneDrive version in the Outlook version. Is that correct what I'm understanding from you? You are correct. The, the, to, to go in reverse, the document has to exist on the OneDrive or on the online version in order for it to be automatically saved back there with you hitting the floppy disk in the top right-hand corner. If you just have a regular Word document on your computer and it does not exist in the online version yet, then the only thing you need to do is come in here to OneDrive and upload that Word document into OneDrive. And then you can access it in the online version of Word and in the application version of Word. But yes, you are correct. In order for it to save automatically back to the cloud, it has to start on the cloud. Otherwise, you're just saving back to its original source, which most likely is probably your computer hard drive, documents folder, desktop folder, whatever that might be. Also, your PowerPoint question, you are correct. The designer is way more robust on the online version. You do have some of the designer tools on the application version. So if you go in here inside of the app, you can go into design 
and you have some of these tools, but you don't necessarily have the designer, right? Where it's creating this pain on the right-hand side. It says, hey, would you want to put it this way? Or did you think about switching it over here? You don't have that exact feature. So you're correct. That is a little bit different. And a last quick question. Sorry, I'm taking time. So no problem. When, you don't have to apologize. Uh, when we are sending a group email, let's say my PhD group of students, there are 14 students, and I want to send one email as a whole group to all the 14 students. How to create that group email? Can you show me, please? Yes, for sure. There's a couple ways. So if you are, do you want to go to the online version or you want to go to the Outlook version? Outlook version. Okay, perfect. If we go here to the Outlook version, the simplest, or I would say the most upfront way, right, is typing in everyone's email address, right, mm -hmm. which would obviously take everybody, take a long time. But if you are working with those 14 people across a semester, right, say it's a class, and you say, okay, this is my nursing 950 class from fall 21, then the only thing you want to do here is come down to your people icon, which is in the bottom left hand corner, you default to mail, then calendar, then people. And inside of people, you're going to do new contact group. Can you please show it once more? I just missed it. Sure. So here, when I open Outlook, I default here to my mail page. I don't see your screen. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not sharing. There we go. When I open Outlook, I default here to my mail page. I can go to calendar in the bottom left or mm -hmm. to create a group. I come over here to people and do new contact group. Say this is my FA 21 N 850 or 985 course. Okay, now I add members and I go and I find those 14 people to add to the contact group. Yes, there's a little bit of work up front and you add those 14 people. But now when you go to send an email after that, instead of typing their names in the address bar, you start typing FA21 and that contact group will populate. And then when you send, it goes to those 14 people. Does that make sense? Yeah. Perfect. I'm glad I could help you with that. Okay. Any other questions I can answer for anybody today? I had a question, Andrew. Go ahead, Trace. <clears throat> um, I shared a document with someone and um, they edited it. Um, they shared it back with me and I saw that they put it in a different folder and mine didn't update. Is it because they put it in a different folder? It was still the same name. Yeah. So what you essentially have now is you have two copies because they reshared it with you. Mm -hmm. Really what they should have done is just made, made the changes and then you would still be in that same one. Okay. Um, yeah, that's, and, and that's where it always gets a little iffy, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of, how are you doing it? How am I doing it? And then you're right. If someone takes it off, offline and then makes changes and then tries to put it back up, but puts it in a different place, it's like, Oh, okay. We're creating all these kind of different pathways and different craziness. So best practice would be you share the original document through a sharing link. That user goes in, makes their changes, and just lets you know that there's been changes made. There's no, hey, I'm resharing it with you. It's not, hey, I put it in a different folder. It's right. they're resharing it. And then you as the owner, if it needs to be put somewhere different or something like that, you can do that. But now you as an owner, now you have two copies rather than your original copy. Right. So yeah, you're correct. With processes and things like that, that doesn't really work too well with finding new versions. We want to kind of stick uh, in that front version and just communicate back and forth. I've made my changes. Take a look. Right. I haven't been able to do anything. Give me another week, you know, whatever that might be, rather than re-downloading, re-uploading a couple of times. Okay, thanks. All right, no problem. All right, I am uh, 209, I'm a little bit over. So this training will be a little bit longer for people, but I think we had good questions here at the end. A lot of good conversations throughout. I wanna thank you again for attending today. I really appreciate your time. I know how busy you are. So thank you for taking some time to sit with me 
and look at these things. Of course, if you need anything else, if you want to look at something a little bit more specifically, whether that's a tool, just Word, just Forms, the whole Office 365 itself, whatever that might be, please do not hesitate to reach out so that we can find a time on our calendar. I'll create a calendar invite for you. Find a time where we're both available and we can sit down and digest this a little bit more so that you feel comfortable using it, right? Because that's where we get the buy-in. Because if as long as we get people using it, then it's you get colleagues using it, you get students using it, you get other stakeholders around the university using it. But if no one buys in and it's just kind of sits there, then it's not doing good for anyone. So we just got to kind of increase the exposure a little bit. And I think we're doing a great job of that here in the School of Nursing and across the university. But we certainly want to just, you know, keep abreast on, on what's changing and the ability to use forms in our classrooms, the ability to use our, our invites for our colleagues, all of those great things. So again, if you need anything else, please don't hesitate to reach out so I can help you. This training is repeated next Wednesday, same time, same place. A little bit of a different conversation, I would assume, but we'll look at a lot of those things. So if you want to come back and hang out, I'll see you then. If not, let me know. So Andrew, you have a new name. Instead of Andrew Bobal, it is Andrew Google. Oh, Andrew Google, Google there we go. Google. <laughs> <laughs> I like it, Patty. I'll take that. I'll take it. Okay, it's a compliment, you. really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. I'll see you later. Have a great rest of your day.